Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 we've got some more coming. Here we go. I'll let them in. Let them join and we can go. Okay, everybody. Well, um, good evening and welcome to the Zoom lecture for the Irish Astronomical Association. Uh, we have with us this evening uh, Dr. Deirdre Coffey from University College Dublin. And I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, this evening. Um, she's going to talk to us about star and planet formation, a whistle stop tour. And Dr. Deirdre Coffey is an assistant professor at the UCD yeah. School of Physics. Uh, she earned her yeah. PhD at the Dublin yeah, no. School of Studies, DS, which she followed with five years of postdoc experience based at uh, Arcetri <laughs> Observatory in Florence, Italy, and also at DS. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Deirdre, and the uh, floor is all yours, and I'll uh, just let some more people in that are joining us. Um, I'm going to mute everybody, and Deirdre, then I just want you to... Uh, unmute yourself because you're the only person that needs to be talking so i'll mute everybody yes and give you unmute yourself and um and take the floor thank you very much okay thank you very much um paul and thank you for the invitation to speak to you this evening um it's a pleasure and it's great to see so many people attending and so many people interested in a topic close to my heart so I, I work in uh, star and planet formation, and so I will give you a very brief tour. I'm not sure um, of who is in the audience, so I'm not sure of your level of expertise, let's say. I know uh, a lot of amateur astronomers are quite are actually quite expert astronomers, really. So um, forgive me if I go... Um, if I repeat things you've already said or uh, you've already heard before in other talks um, or... Um, if it's too basic, but I hope I hit the right note. So um, I work in UCD and um, as I said, my research is in the area of star and planet formation. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about how the field came about and um, you know where, where we are now in the field. So star formation research really only fully developed as an independent field of astrophysics in the latter half of the last century. But its beginnings date back to Laplace and his nebular hypothesis, which he formulated in 1796. And it's one of the oldest scientific, uh, surviving scientific hypotheses, actually. And it involved a rotating cloud of matter cooling and contracting under its own gravity to form a central star, um, as you can see in this cartoon here. And then the remaining matter then falls, uh, it, it flattens into, as it revolves, into a disk shape. And there uh, in this for planets. And so despite this theory being around in 1796, at the turn of the century, it was still kind of generally assumed that stars lived forever. And, and so star, star or stellar origins was largely considered a question for cosmologists. But then in the early 1900s, um, the discovery of the nature of stars as thermonuclear reactors um, with, with Einstein's uh, theories, um, explained it, this explained stellar evolution and death, but it didn't address the question of stellar birth. And so little was known beyond this kind of broad understanding of this ongoing physical process involving a giant molecular cloud of gas and dust um, that collapses under its own gravity, forms clumps of gas and dust. And then each clump within this cloud here would then condense and individually contract into what we call a protostar and then eventually become a fusion powered stellar core, or a, uh, that's a pre-main sequence star. So really this field is a new field. However, we now have these wonderful pictures to support these, this theory of uh, star formation. And the first thing we have is, the, is these huge clouds of gas and dust that supposedly collapse to form the new stars. And here we have a beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of um, the interstellar medium here. This is the Horsehead Nebula. And this is dust. It's a cloud um, of gas and dust, but this it's the dust that blocks the light, the background light. So we can see the cloud 
by the fact that it's in silhouette. Um, and there's many of these clouds. We can see here a beautiful picture of the Eagle Nebula, um, nebula just meaning cloud. And this is a Hubble, HST is Hubble Space Telescope, optical image of the Eagle Nebula. And we can see all the clouds and all the stars are illuminating the cloud and the cavities within the clouds. And there's some fantastic close-ups of various uh, uh, zones in this nebula. And one of the most famous is this particular region here. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see these beautiful columns against the background light. And these are called the, or they're known as the pillars of creation. And so we see that there's just kind of fingers coming up out of the cloud. And at the very top, we can see um, loads of, of, of starlight bursting out from, from the, the cloud material. So really what's happening here is that there's lots of baby stars being born and their starlight is escaping from the cloud. Um, and we can see here very, if you kind of look very close, you can sort of see these finger shapes and each of those is would have a new protosun, uh, a baby star in it. So the size of this, just for scale, the size of that is actually the size of our solar system. Uh, you know, as an as an approximate scale. <clears throat> so this is really, um, really impressive imagery. This image was taken in 1995 with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it, was, it was so well renowned, this image, and used everywhere in National Geographic, everything, great publicity. And so they went back to it again for the 21st, 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope and took the image again. The Hubble Space Telescope since had been upgraded with new cameras and everything um, since um, the 90s. And so they took this uh, image again, the pillars of creation. Now they have more um, of the image down here, the base of the pillars. And so this is an optical image here. And then this on the right hand side is the same region, but it's taken in infrared. And we can see with the infrared uh, cameras, you can actually see through the dust and you can see the stars shining through on the other side. So if you look at these three stars, just as an example in the middle and over here, you can't see them. <clears throat> so the infrared images allow you to see different details than the optical images um, and, and another fantastic image from the Hubble Space Telescope. Not only did the observations with these telescopes give us the evidence um, that we were looking for, that there was these huge molecular clouds that were collapsing, but it gave us evidence as well of disks that were forming when the clouds collapsed. So previously there had been um, evidence from what we call a spectral energy distribution where you would have light from the star and you would expect the light from the star to have certain um, intensity at, at different uh, in different colors uh, and and it seemed all these young stars seem to not only have the intensity as you would expect but they seem to have this additional uh, intensity at red colors it's what's called uh, uh, or infrared uh, infrared excess is what it's called and so observing these very young stars, they had this kind of additional excess in, in the infrared region. And that was presumed to be coming from a disk around the young star. And indeed it was, um, but we didn't get confirmation, uh, a direct image of disks until we had these images from Hubble. And we see these disks here in silhouette again, just like the clouds. So the disks are clearly full of gas, but also full of dust and the dust is blocking the background light. Now, what is the background light here? It doesn't seem to be a star, but it's actually uh, a nebula uh, illuminated by very bright stars in the very center. And so the starlight's reflecting off the cloud and re-reflecting towards um, this baby uh, sun here. And, and then the disk is blocking that background, background light. So we're building up this evidence of this picture that's supporting uh, Laplace's theory of um, star formation. If we don't have the disks against the background light, we can also see them by they they block their own uh, starlight. So, for example, there's a dark lane where the star is because the star is actually hidden in the middle of the disk. So these would be in a situation where um, the disk, uh, the face of the disk is is 
sorry, the edge of the disc, we're looking at the edge of the disc. And so we can't actually see the star because it's kind of embedded in the center of the disc. But what we can see is the starlight emerging from either side of the disc. So again, the disc is the dark line blocking the starlight and the star is coming out, uh, creeping out from the dust of the disc surrounding it. But things were not that simple. So the very first step in the realization of the true complexity of the star formation process came in the early 1950s when Herbig and Harrow, two scientists, calculated, or sorry, cataloged a, a series of small ionized nebula, which were consistently found to be located near star forming regions. But the nature, so these are the, the these are just more clouds that seem to be just, we can see them because they're ionized. Um, in other words, they're, they're heated, they're plasma material. And the nature of the link between these, what they became to be called Herbig Harrow objects because they were cataloged by Herbig and Harrow or HH objects. And the nature of these was, um, was not realized until about the mid 1970s when spectra were taken of them. And there was a connection between those spectral lines. They actually looked like the spectra of shocked material. So gas that is shocked, like something is ramming into the gas and, and making it, um, you know, emit these spectral lines, uh, uh, transferring energy and, and causing them to be uh, to brighten up and, and emit these spectral lines. But then a key advance came in the 1980s um, when a connection was made between these shocks and what was observed to be jets coming from young stars. So this is an image from the 1980s where we can see three very well-known young stars at this stage. And we can see these, these trails coming out from either pole let's say of the star this one is less obvious and um and these are jets of transpires that are being emitted from these young stars and there was a connection made between the shocks and the jets now it was actually known already that um that jets were emitted from uh, galaxies uh, as they accreted and now suddenly it seemed like the same case was happening during the same situation was happening during the star formation process. So it seemed that these jets were coming out from these young stars somehow, belting the material, the cloud material around it, and then shocking that cloud material. And that was the nebula that was being observed by Herbig and Harrow in the 50s. Now we have lovely Hubble Space Telescope images of these jets and we can see if we zoom into this very famous system HH30 we can see the the disk in silhouette and then we can see this two collimated material um sorry two collimated jets of material coming from either pole of the star and significantly they're perpendicular to the disk plane so this geometry is is important here we have the again the discs, just a close up of the disc, um, a silhouette of the disc, and then the starlight being reflected, and then the jet traveling upwards. There's you usually one jet is brighter than the other because the other is either traveling away from us or into a cloud material of, of some sort where it's being hidden. So these jets were observed to be what's called bipolar, coming out from either pole and perpendicular to the disc. So it's only really in the last few decades that a coherent picture of star formation has emerged. So as the molecular cloud collapses, any initial rotation that's present in that cloud core um, amplifies as a result uh, of the collapse. And that causes a spinning of the core and the formation from the remaining infalling dust and gas of um, a circumstellar disk. And then somehow, unexpectedly, this, this accretion process, which is the movement of the material through the disk onto the star, unexpectedly, this causes 
the launch of very high velocity bipolar jets, and they transport considerable amounts of matter and energy away from the stars. And they're found to be highly collimated and they comprise of knots of material. So see the way it's not smooth. It seems to be what, what we call knots, like lumps of material along the flow axis. And they gradually fade with distance from the source. And then as these jets impact on the surrounding cloud, they form what we call HH objects. And the morphologies of these HH objects are extremely diverse and um, from a very symmetrical um, uh, bow shock, uh, sort of a bow shock into the cloud, shock front into the cloud. Can we meet uh, everyone again? Okay, so that's, it. that's even me muted. Um, yes, did if you unmute yourself again now, that's it should be whoever that was has gone away. Okay, thank you. So from very cement, I was just saying that um, as the jets travel into the cloud, they create these uh, herbicarrier objects, which are shocked material, and their morphologies can be very diverse. So we can see very symmetric shocks, or we can see very asymmetric shocks, depending on you know, the, the cloud material that they're traveling into. And that equally means that a jet going out from one pole of the star can have a certain morphology and a jet going out from the other side can have a different one depending on the material that it's traveling into. And um, so they can be, they can be, you know, uh, I'll show you pictures actually, where are the pictures? Um, they can have a, a spread out uh, form or they can be very collimated. So here I have a couple of very, they're just, yeah, here we go. Very short video. So you can see these jets traveling out. This is this very famous um, HH30 object. And these images, just, just three or four images taken year on year and put together to form a kind of a movie. And so this is one type of jet, which is very collimated. And here is uh, XZ tau, which is its neighbor. And it's a binary system. And instead of a very collimated jet, it has almost like an explosion coming out of the star. Now, this might be um, a different type of uh, version of the star, which uh, is much more violent and has these episodic explosions, possibly in XOR. So these young stars are much more exciting than we had anticipated. Here we have an image again from the Hubble Space Telescope of a star here, and we can see the bipolar jet coming out extremely symmetrically. And we can see here the bow shock at the very tip where it's ramming into the cloud material. Again, here, more jets here. This is a much more knotty structure you can see as it travels into the cloud. And here we have a famous picture of 2002. This wasn't taken with Hubble, it was taken with uh, the telescopes in Chile with the, the European Southern Observatory. Um, and here we have the star in the middle that we can't see because of the disc and the starlight coming out on either side of the disc. And then almost like a machine gun, it's just did, 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 into the cloud material and ending up in this, in this uh, bow shock here. And the exact same on the other side, the, the two jets look different, slightly different because of the, you know, depends on what the cloud is like on either side, but they're so symmetric in the sense that they're extremely collimated and they're traveling along the exact same line. Um, and the distance of that bow shock on either end is uh, pretty much the same. So a highly symmetric jet. And think about the scale of this now. Here in the center is a newly forming star and the solar system would be around this size. And so these jets are traveling at very high speeds and phenomenal distances and managing to stay extremely collimated while they travel all that way. Again, one of the jets, here's another picture of a famous jet, HH 4647. Um, and this is a Hubble image again. And here the, again, the star is hidden in the middle. And we can see this jet um, coming out one side. This isn't symmetric in the sense that we can't actually see the other side of the jet because here it is, it's traveling into 
into a cloud and, and it's being, um, you know, hidden from view. So how does it all work? Well, as we have a, a cloud of material, um, there's always going to be some rotation present. And as we know from the law of conservation of angular momentum, we know when an ice skater is spinning around and she, he or she draws in their arms, they spin faster. And this is the law of conservation of angular momentum, similar to the cloud. The cloud draws in its arms, so to speak. In other words, it gravitationally collapses to get smaller. And so it starts to spin faster. And so this spinning causes the formation of this disk here um, along uh, it, perpendicular to the rotation axis. And then um, supposedly this just gets faster and faster as the material travels through the disk onto the star. And here is where we come across what's called the angular momentum problem. In theory, by the time the material gets to the star, the star should be spinning so fast that it's actually spinning beyond its breakup velocity and it should just break apart because it's spinning so fast that it can't keep itself together in theory. But I mean, clearly that's not actually happening because we have stars formed all the time and they're not breaking apart. And even the young stars that we look at aren't spinning with these huge, uh, very high velocities or speeds. They're, they're actually spinning much lower than what we would calculate from our theory. So what's happening? We have this well-known angular momentum problem um, in, in star formation and, and in in gravitational collapse of the accretion and ejection in general. Well, many theories are proposed and one of the theories that's gained traction and seems to be able to explain, um, explain things is um, the theory of mag which relies on magnetic forces as well as centrifugal forces. Centrifugal forces is basically that, um, you know, as you as you spin something around and let go of it, it'll then fly off. Um, and that's a sort of a, a um, those those forces with the uh, from the rotation and from the magnetic fields combine. And that's what's relied upon in these models of how this whole thing works. So we start with one of the basic assumptions is that there's a magnetic field treading the cloud as the cloud collapses the magnetic field moves with the cloud, collapses in with the cloud, it's pinched in the middle here. And so what you end up with is a situation where, I should go to the next slide. Oops, no, can't go back now, can I? Oh, I can. Um, you end up with a situation where you have, a, this is actually on its side compared to what we've been looking at. So this would be the disc here. And you end up with a magnetic field treading the disc and the magnetic field is pinched here and it keeps getting more and more pinched as the disc collapses and the material flows onto the star. Equally, not just is the material collapsing on towards the star, but remember that all of this is rotating, it's spinning around. All of this is rotating. So the magnetic field is traveling with this material. And so the magnetic field is going to be rotating around. So you end up with this jolly mess here where you have the magnetic field going through the star, going through the disc. This is actually a computer simulation. And then the field lines, instead of just going straight out up and down from the disc plane, they actually end up spiraling like this in this kind of messy situation here. And so the idea is that if material is traveling in through the disc, and they get to the point where they're being pinched by the magnetic field lines. And suddenly these centrifugal forces hurl the, the material out along, some of the material out along these magnetic field lines, which forms our jet. And they, they travel up along the field lines and start to rotate around as the field lines rotate around and they travel off straight up. And this is how we see material being um, ejected from a newly forming star, as well as the material falling onto the star. And the idea is that this magnetic field lines will then cause a breaking effect on the disk. And so they will transport that rotational energy that's causing the star to get really, really fast. They'll actually take away some of that, 
a high spin and send it out along the jet instead. And so these magnetic field lines will help to slow down or break the, the, the stellar rotation and the disc rotation. And instead, the jet will start to rotate because we have to conserve angular momentum. We can't just get rid of it. We have to just transfer it from, from one place to the next. So it'll send that rotational energy out along the, desk, the, the jets. And this also explains then how these jets are highly collimated because the magnetic fields are actually um, containing the plasma material within them. And that can go for extremely far distances. This is a beautiful image taken um, only recently with the Hubble Space Telescope in the infrared. Um, and my PhD student actually was working on it and recently published um, a paper with this image in it. And it was also used as the um, image of the day for the European Space Agency. Um, or the European, yeah, the European Space Agency. So, so here we have then, if, if this is the case, then this model, again, we have to find proof. We have to observe things to prove these models. We can't just uh, throw around theories without trying to prove them. Um, these jets should actually be, we should be able to observe them rotating. And um, so, in fact, I did a lot of work in this um, uh, in um, the early noughties and um, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we found the first indications that these jets were actually spinning and perhaps extracting the angular momentum from the disk. And so we suddenly were getting to the bottom of how this whole mechanism works. And um, now with um, improved telescope facilities, so I was using the Hubble Space Telescope at the time, this image I'm showing you now um, is relying on uh, the new uh, telescope facility in Chile, ALMA. I don't know if you've heard of it, but ALMA is, um, is giving us these really high resolution images. And um, Lee um, et al. published this uh, paper in Nature where they had the, they found the spinning of the disc is in a certain way and the spinning of the jet is in the same way. Both jets um, uh, was spinning in the same way. So that's obviously a good check to see, well, are you actually really observing a spinning of the jet? Well, if you are, it should really be spinning in the same direction as the disc. And Lee had reported that that is in, indeed what they saw. And um, so here we have, again, just to scale it, here we have the solar system size is about the size of this. And we have these jets, which are traveling huge distances compared to the size of the actual solar system. So very exciting results. The, those results were published by Lee um, in 2017. And then there was uh, followed by more exciting results from ALMA along the same lines um, around the same time as well. So it looks like these stars are forming by this magneto centrifugal launching mechanism, which is relying on magnetic fields treading the disk. So here we have a schematic of how this would work where material is falling in through the disk and then some of it's falling onto the star because the star has a magnetic field as well. So any magnetic field lines would have to connect them with the stellar magnetic field. And then some of the field, the field lines are pinched here and then the material would fly out up towards the north and south pole in these bipolar outflows. Now, a key question apart from saying, OK, it looks like this works, is that with this theory, as often with many theories, there are many flavors. And so which flavor is the one that's correct? And a key distinguishing factor between the different flavors is, well, where exactly does the material start to be flung away off into these jets? Is it here? Is it further back? Do the, does the material start to be, to be flung off into bipolar jets out here? Um, how close to the star do we have to get before we travel into a jet? Where is the jet launch point? And this is very difficult to know because we can't directly observe it because these stars are forming on scales that we can't actually see with our telescopes. They're too small. The spatial scales are too small. And often, as we saw, they're often hidden behind this disk material. So really, we can only observe the jet far away and then try and 
work backwards to try and see what we could have imagined would have happened um, right at the display at the base of the jet. So we can't directly measure it, but maybe we can measure um, the jet uh, and, and its kinematics, it, how, uh, what its velocity is like um, and its shape. And maybe that can give us some indication. And an important point to note is that um, those, those magnetic field lines, depending on which model we decide to use, will have implications for planet forming regions in the disk. So if we have high concentration of field lines coinciding with where we expect planet to form, planets to form, then we need to take that into account when we're coming up with our recipe for how planets form. So here's an image of a disk. And sorry, not an image, a schematic of a disk. So here we have the, the protostar. There's a lot of information here. Don't worry about it. Um, this is the protostar here and the magnetic field. And what we expect here is just a pure gas disk. Then we have, uh, we begin to have dust. Dust can't form very close to the star because the heat of the star will prevent it from forming very close. It'll break down and become gas. So then we have dust further out here. And this, the disk then gets huge, very, very wide and colder as we get further away from the star. Okay, so we have this big, huge outer disk here, which is quite cold and we call it a mass reservoir. The planet forming region in this schematic is around here. Now it's around 10 AU. One AU, one astronomical unit is the distance from the sun of the earth. So this is 10 AU, which is about 10 times the distance of the earth from the sun. So this is about where in our system where Saturn would be. 30 AU is about the extent of our solar system in terms of the planets where, where Neptune would be. So this is around where Saturn would be. And this is where we sort of say, well, approximately this is where the planets would be forming. And so if we're looking at magnetic fields in the disk, we need to know, well, is that coinciding with 10 AU? Or are we talking about something that's way out here at 100 AU? Or are we talking about the jet being launched from inside 1 AU in this region really, really close to the star here? And, and, and it's not affecting this planet forming region at all. That's what we like to, that's what we want to know when we're trying to test these models of how these jets are launched. So it has very serious implication for planet forming. Now, an important point to note is that here we have which telescopes are able to look at each region. Here we have ALMA and ALMA can look at cooler gas and dust. So ALMA is able to see the disk from this region, but ALMA is blind to this inner region here. It's blind at distances where we expect Earth-type planets to form. So yet again, we're prevented from seeing um, the very interesting region very close to the star. And the Hubble Space Telescope, HST, and also eight meter ground-based telescopes. And that, that eight meter would be referring to the telescopes in Chile, which are eight meters, European Southern Observatory telescopes. They can do direct imaging of um, disks and they can see this region here as well. So we're able to observe the outer disk, but we're not able to observe the inner disk just yet <clears throat> in uh, imaging. Here we have, a very famous image from Michel Tau from the ALMA Consortium. And they took this beautiful image of HL Tau in 2015, they published it. And just to go back again to our nice image here, way back in the 80s, in the 1980s, uh, we think to ourselves, ah, bless. Here's HL Tau here. And now we're able to see this kind of detail, which is the disc right there in the very center. I mean, this is just phenomenal progress. So this is a 3.5 millimeter uh, telescope, Calor Alta in Spain, and this is an optical image. This is over two line, an optical image. And here we have the scale is 5,000 astronomical units, so 5,000 the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And this image of a disk is famous because, apart from the fact that it's amazing resolution, but for also for what it reveals, that the disk is not um, smooth. The disk structure seems to have what looks like these gaps. And this is very exciting because why would there be gaps in the disk 
except maybe if a planet was sweeping up the material as it formed, like a snowball um, gathering, uh, increasing in size as it travels around. And, um, and so this is a very exciting image and possibly we're observing here um, newly forming planets. Again, remember the resolution, we're looking at the outer disk here, we're not looking at the inner disk where we would expect to see planets, uh, the distances of our own solar system. Not after that image, then there was published a whole series, oops, a whole series, a, a zoo of images of lots of other targets. And we could see that these disk gaps um, are very common. Not in all cases, sometimes we have smooth disks. So we have, and sometimes we have what seem like spirals in the disks. And sometimes we just have simple gaps in the disk. Um, sometimes the disks are face on, they're facing us and we can see everything. Sometimes they're edge on and we can't see the substructure very well. Sometimes they're very big disks, sometimes they're very small. So a typical zoo with lots of, of different types. Um, so now it seems like these gaps are, are you know, it's assumed that they're, that they're because uh, planets are forming in these regions. How do planets form? Well, the, the, the current theories are that they can either, as I said, um, so here, sorry, just here we have the, the star in the center and then we have the disk, what we call a flared disk. So the light from the star is actually, if you like, eroding the disk. The UV light is eroding the disk uh, very close to the star and out along the surface here. Uh, and, and so it results in this flaring shape. Um, and eventually all the dust particles will, will settle through gravitation to the mid plane of this disk and they'll bump into each other and they may grow in size because they'll stick together. And so gradually they'll, they'll have less of these particles, but they'll be bigger and the bigger ones will settle to the mid plane faster and um, you'll have what's called a settled disk and the, the material is continuing to accrete onto the star. Then eventually what will happen is that the, the light of the star will continue to erode the disk and it will erode not just the surface, but it will erode away um, very close to the disk and evaporate um, the disk. And eventually we'll be left with what's called a debris disk where we just have no more gas and we just have um, the, the large planetesimals, as they're called, uh, settling into the mid plane. And the idea is that the planets would form either by bump, by small particles bumping into to each other and sticking together. So we call them particles of dust and then as they get bigger, we call them grains and then we call them pebbles. And then they aggregate into what's called planetesimals. And then they become rocky planets. Um, giant planets may actually be formed directly through accretion of gas. So in the exact same way as a star would form, we might have a planet forming by the material just spinning around and then just gradually um, accumulating onto the, onto the planet. So it can be through this aggregate process or this accretion process. And so now we have very exciting um, proposals going to telescopes, which are hunting for these accreting protoplanets. So looking at these disks with gaps and looking at features uh, in the disks and seeing if we can find signatures of um, what we would call uh, signatures of accretion. And that would be in certain um, chemical lines that would be a, a if we take the spectrum, we would see uh, very bright uh, lines, for example, in H alpha, and that would be uh, in hydrogen um, alpha transition. And that would be because um, the planet is accreting. And so we would then be observing planetary accretion. So this is a very, very new and active field of research at the moment. Another interesting um, thing about the jets and their connection to the disk and the hunt for planets is that as a jet travels away from the star, it um, has been observed often to be straight as a die, but often also to be wiggling. And I don't just mean wiggling randomly, but wiggling with a very clear symmetric shape. So if you have the star in the center, you have a, 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 you can trace the jet trajectory 
to the North Pole, let's say, and also to the South Pole. And you can see that there's a symmetry. And if there is that symmetry, what's causing it? Here we have an image of L1157 um, published in 2016. And this is taken, this image is taken a sort of a, um, let's say a, a wide view, uh, sorry, a large scale view of, of this system. And so this jet wiggling is seen on a very large scale. And um, here instead is not an image, but just a, a plot um, of a star. So just imagine the stars in the middle. This is the disk around the star. It's rotating, um, which is what the blue and red indicates. Uh, blue and red shifted sides of the disk. Um, and then we have the jet coming out one side and the jet coming out the other side. This is data published by my um, PhD student, Jessica Urkel, last year. And she measured that this jet is indeed wiggling as well. But the difference between these two is that this work is an observation of this wiggling very, very close to the jet launch point, very, very close to the star and on the other side as well. It's, it's observed to be wiggling very close to the star. And if we observe very close to the star, we're much more likely to be observing something that is connected to something going on in the disk, such as planet forming. So we need to try and model this wiggling. And unfortunately, in this case, we can see that the jet is not very symmetric um, itself, even morphologically, never mind about the shape of the wiggling, but actually the jet is very sort of straight and, and collimated on one side, but then it seems to um, you know, expand very rapidly here on the other side. And so there seems to be either a difference in the cloud material on either side of the jet, or something related to how the jet itself is being launched that's making it be launched differently on one side than the other, which is very strange indeed. So here we have a modeling of that um, image that you just saw, and we have different um, model solutions that we tried to do to model this wiggling. It was very difficult because they're different on one side to the other, but we were able to identify that um, it could be caused by the presence of a planetary mass companion, which was very interesting. And this, if that was the case, this planetary mass companion would be between six and 12 Jupiter masses, and it would be close into the star and it would be misaligned and um, have a misaligned orbit. In other words, it wouldn't be orbiting um, uh, within the disk plane. It would be slightly, um, you know, coming up out of the disk plane. So like this, this, um, this uh, cartoon here. So you might have a misaligned orbit, for example, this dotted line around here. Or if it wasn't a planetary companion or a substellar companion, because it could be a brown dwarf or something like that, that isn't actually quite a planet. Um, it could also be other reasons like a warp in the disk, which might actually be caused by the fact that um, we are you know, using a mechanism that has uh, magnetic fields and they could uh, themselves be causing some sort of a disk warp at a certain distance where the outer disk might be traveling in a different plane. It might have a different plane to the inner disk. So here we have a schematic with the inner disk in brown and the outer disk in gray. So this is very interesting that we can see this is only last year's um, publications where we have this jet wiggling observed very close to the jet base and being able to give us this information. And so what we need to do is find a well-behaved system and we need to test this, this theory. So this isn't a well-behaved system. We need to find a system with a very symmetric jet and we need to get very close in and observe, can we see this wiggling very close to the jet base? And then can we model that and can we use that as a probe of planet formation as the star is forming? And the intriguing thing about this is that all the other methods of hunting for planet formation are observing far away from the star because the closer into you get to the star, you just can't see anymore. Whereas this, and, and, and that's the region where um, we would expect, um, you know, earth, uh, uh, earth distances or uh, planets that, a lot of planets that have already been discovered that are already formed are, are observed to be very close into the star. And this is a region that we can't detect with our current facilities like ALMA. Um, and HST, we can only observe the disk farther away from the star. So this jet wiggling would allow us to actually probe planet formation very close to the star. So it's an interesting tool that we must um, continue to investigate now. 
So let's look a little bit about uh, plants and um, their demographics. Um, and we see that we're really discovering planets um, all the time. Um, so we've nearly 5,000 planets observed as of the 1st of January, 2022. And I think the, the one of the most profound discoveries is the diversity of all of these planets, that there's so, there's so many different types. And not only is there so many different types, but there's so many different types of planets that we we have we don't have a similar type of planet in our own solar system. So, for example, we have what we call super Earth planets, which are, you know, Earth um, density planets. Yeah, but they're much bigger or, or they're also called mini Neptunes. And, and these are called transitional planets as well and they're the most numerous type of planet in the solar system and or sorry not in our solar system but the of the planets that have been discovered and yet there is no such planet in our own solar system so you can imagine if we come up with theories of star and planet formation based on just what we see in our own solar system we're missing a really big part of the puzzle because we're not considering these transitional planets that have no analogs in our own solar system And up until now, planet classification systems have, they, they, we need a robust classification system um, in order to come up with star and planet forming theories. And up until now, we've really classed them according to size or their bulk compositions. So for example, we would say hot Jupiter or a super Earth or something like that, just to, you know, similar to what we know on our own doorstep, but might be bigger. So a bigger Earth or whatever. And, um, and we're, we're, we're classing them on size and composition. How can we know their composition? Well, we can try and get an estimate of their density by, density is, is basically calculated by mass divided by volume. And we can um, find their planetary mass and we can find their planetary, the, the radius of the planet and so calculate the volume um, by using two very well-known methods at this stage, now radial velocity measurements and transit measurements, which I'll just discuss briefly in the next slide. And if we can find the mass and the radius, therefore the volume, then we can calculate an estimate of the bulk density of the planet. If we know the density, then we can estimate or we can guess at the composition of the planet, what it's made of. Um, and so this is the classification system that we're currently relying on. So the radial velocity method is, uh, maybe you've come across this already in previous talks, but very briefly, it's where you have a star and a planet rotating around it. And um, the planet's rotation around the star causes um, the star's uh, signature to, to um, it, it causes the, well, the radial velocity is, depends on if you understand the concept of a Doppler shift, but basically the spectra, spectral lines will look bluer and then redder and then bluer and then redder as the planet goes around the star. And so in this way, we can get the mass of the planet. Um, in a similar way, we can observe a star and a planet traveling in front of it. And as, a, as the starlight is blocked by the planet, we can see, well, what size is the planet? by seeing how much of the starlight is blo being blocked as it travels in front of it. And that's called the transit method. And that can give us the volume or the radius, the diameter and the radius, and therefore the volume of the planet. And so with these two methods, which are well uh, tried and tested at this stage, we can get the bulk composition. But it doesn't always work so well. Because for example, the bulk composition, or sorry, the, the densities, the size and densities of Earth and Venus are the same are very similar anyway, but they have very different atmospheres and surface conditions. So this is not really um, going to work all the time. Um, it's, and so we find that the physics is not enough. We need a measure of the chemistry. So the next step in trying to classify these planets um, is to look at exoplanet atmospheres. And then if we can connect observing those atmospheres we can make we can infer something about the surface conditions or their bulk composition and um, that would be great so the next thing we can possibly observe is the exoplanet atmospheres and then we can we're getting closer and closer to a planet classification scheme that might be more robust and then we can use that to find out well how planets 
are formed and how obviously star and planet formation is intimately connected. So in the atmospheres, and if we can do it on a grand enough scale, then we can maybe correlate the observations of the atmospheres with, um, you know, we might be able to infer something about the surface conditions. So here are a lot of, just an example of some of the processes um, that go on to create, that um, affect uh, an atmosphere of a planet. So for example, you might have uh, an impact which might cause maybe there's a, uh, some of the atmosphere to escape. You might have volcanoes on the planet, which will cause gas going up into the air, and that would form part of the atmosphere. You might have, um, you know, rain or snow um, on, from the atmosphere onto the surface of the planet, or evaporation the other way around of, you know, um, ice from the planet's surface into clouds and into the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, so there's lots of different things. You can have escape of the atmosphere as well. So if the, if the atmosphere is heated to a certain degree, maybe it's close to a star, and um, some of the atmosphere might get enough energy to be able to escape the gravity of the planet. And so lots of, um, lots of different um, processes that go into creating um, an atmosphere and maintaining an atmosphere as well. So if we... If we look at the atmospheres, examine the atmospheres of a, of, of a, a large number of planets, then we might be able to um, establish, um, we might be able to disentangle all these various effects. So the European Space Agency is now funding the aerial space mission, and um, this is what, uh, a space mission that I am involved in, um, and I'll talk about Ireland's contribution to that through. Um, so, so the mission is to probe exoplanet atmospheres, and this mission is to address a key theme of cosmic vision. Cosmic vision is is the European Space Agency's strategy. Um, it's like a, a what, ten year strategy um, to. Um, you know, to, to decide what are the main scientific questions that it wants to answer, and then what space missions might, will be able to address those questions. So one of the questions is the conditions for planet formation and the emergence of life. Very exciting question. And so this aerial mission is going to address um, that theme. Um, so it's a consortium of 50 countries as well as uh, the European Space Agency, NASA, and the Japanese Space Agency. It's due to be launched in early 2029. It's going to go it'll be a four-year mission, at minimum, and um, hopefully longer, depending on if it lasts. And um, it's going to go to an orbit at L2, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, lots of spacecraft are going there, um, and it's an orbit which is just beyond the moon <clears throat> on the other side of, of, the, of, the, of the moon. And it's going to examine exoplanet atmospheres. And how is it going to do that? Well, if we look at, take the schematic here of a star, and we look at a planet going around the star, the star will, the planet will travel in front of the star, block its light, and travel behind the star and be blocked by the star. And this, these two motions, this orbital motion, we can use to our advantage. So when the planet goes in front of the star, we call it a primary eclipse. And the star's radiation just uh, is, is transmitted through the planet's atmosphere. And so the star's radiation goes through the planet's atmosphere here. And then we can see it on Earth and we can observe it. But it'll go through the planet's atmosphere and it will be changed by the planet's atmosphere. And therefore, we can understand what the planet's atmosphere is made of. So um, we can get, for example, spectrum of the planet's atmosphere in this way. And that's called transmission spectroscopy. Then as the planet goes behind the star, we have what's called a secondary eclipse and we can observe the exoplanet's thermal radiation will disappear. And then it'll reappear as it comes out the other end. And so we can be able to, we'll be able to deduce, um, you know, the, the temperature of the, of the planet as it goes behind the star. We also will be able to measure things called something called phase curve. So phase curve photometry is where we again have the planet traveling around the star, blocking the light from the star. 
But as it's going around in its orbit, the planet itself is being illuminated by the star. And that illumination changes as the planet goes around the star. And so we can measure the illumination and the changes in the illumination during the orbit. And from that, we can derive interesting information about it again, about the temperature of the planet and um, the heat distribution um, of the planet and uh, the albedo of the planet, which is how the planet reflects the light from the star. So say if you had a planet that was covered in ice, it would reflect a huge amount because ice is very reflective. If you had a planet that was mainly made of dark rock, it would um, reflect very little light compared to how much it would reflect from the ice. And so the brightness of the planet can, um, can tell something about um, the planet's uh, surface and also its atmosphere. One problem though that we'll come across is clouds. And so um, for a select number of planets, Ariel perform a deep survey of their cloud systems and study their seasonal and daily atmospheric variation. So here we can see just to give you an idea, as you go deeper and denser through the atmosphere, this one is Jupiter, you can see all the different cloud systems and clouds are not made of water, clouds are made of all sorts of, here's water, H2O, but there's all sorts of other chemicals that the clouds are made of um, on these planets. And some planets are cloudier than others. L to M dwarfs, um, we have very little uh, cloud. So clouds can pose difficulties when we're trying to observe um, atmospheric chem chemistry. So all of this has to be taken into account in complex model of uh, exoplanet atmospheres. So what about Ireland's contribution to the space? Well, um, Professor Tom Ray of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies um, is co-principal investigator on the aerial space mission. And um, I am the national project manager for Ireland's contribution to the space mission. And what is Ireland's contribution? Well, we are responsible for, for providing five um, dichroic filters. And what are dichroic filters? Well, they are um, almost like lenses, let's say, where the light travels, hits the surface of the filter, some of it travels through, and some of it is bounced backwards, reflected. And we can choose, by putting a, a surface coating on this filter, we can choose which color goes through and which color is bounced back. And here we have uh, just a plot of this is wavelength or color, if you like, on the bottom axis. So we can say, well, anything green, so think of the, the rainbow, anything from green, yellow, and red will go through and anything uh, blue and purple will be bounced back. And so we would say, you know, well, the threshold then for this dichro filter will be green. Um, and so we know that this would be um, we would know that anything red will go through and anything blue would be bounced back. So we are doing five dichroic filters. We're going to have thresholds of all different um, colors. So it's going to be very complicated. The light is going to come in. It's going to hit one of these dichroic filters and then it's going to be sent two different instruments depending different colors are going to be sent to different instruments and um not only is for example the red light going to go to this instrument but some you know the the the, the more orange light might go to one and then the redder deeper redder light might go to another so it'll be broken at the green line in the beginning and then subsequently it might be broken at the yellow line again and then it might be broken at the orange line and so the light will continue to be subdivided five times to go to uh, the different instruments within Ariel. And so it's a very critical piece of technology and a new piece of technology under development uh, that hasn't existed before. So very exciting and um, frustrating as well at times when it doesn't work. So um, this technology then um, requires a, a deposition chamber used to coat the glass surface. So here is just a picture, an example of what I'm talking about, so you have a sense of it. But this is a very special glass surface that can actually be used in space conditions. So this glass will survive freezing temperatures and it will survive radiation from the sun and all sorts of things. And then it's put into this chamber and then 
co a coating is put on this glass, not just one coating, but up to 50 different coatings can be deposited in individual layers. And these coatings are so, so thin. Each coating is extremely thin. So a few microns thick, what is that? Well, if you think of the tip of a pencil is about a millimeter and a micron is about, um, is a thousand times smaller than the tip of a pencil, a thousand times smaller. Each coating is that is a thousand times smaller than the tip of a pencil in thickness. And then we build up those coatings and there's maybe, there could be, you know, well, it depends, but I'm just picking 50 out of the sky. There could be 50 coatings deposited in individual layers onto this surface. And then you end up with your filter, your dichroic filter that chops the light off at a certain color. And not only do we have to manufacture them, but we have to test them as well and make sure that they work out in space. And so here we have what's called cryogenic testing machine. This is located in, um, in Dias, the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies in Dublin. And um, the lads call it the fridge. And, and they also refer to it as the coldest place in Ireland. Um, and it is going down to minus 300 degrees. So really, really, really cold, really cold. Um, and so, um, you have, uh, sorry, this is a background uh, equipment here. This is not part, it's a badly taken photograph, but we just have this section here in the middle and then it's sitting here um, on, on its uh, wheels. And if you just look at the shelf here in the middle, this is where we have placed our dichroic filter to be tested. And here's just a two euro for scale. And here's another filter as well. And um, so these are these this kind of reflective surface then is put in this what's called a mount and it's held there in place. And then the temperatures are sent down to four Kelvin and which is nearly uh, zero, absolute zero. And um, then back up to room temperature again. And that's cycled through um, about 15 or 20 times to make sure that the filter doesn't break or snap or do anything like that. And um, it takes about, a, it could take a day to actually have the temperature go down to four Kelvin and then another day to rise it back up again. So to do that 15 or 20 times, I mean, you're talking about maybe a month to do this testing. And then, um, and, and then once that's done, then we have to bring it all down to a very low temperature. And then we have to see, will it operate at that temperature? Will it cut the light off at that green color or whatever color we choose, just as it does at room temperature? So this is what's happening. Um, this is Ireland's contribution to the aerial space mission and um, developing these filters or following the development of the filters and then testing the filters as well, and then delivering them to the European Space Agency for integration into the instrument. And the instrument will then be integrated into the telescope. So I hope I gave you um, a very um, good impression of the exciting times that are we're living in for star and planet formation and um, it really was just a whistle stop tour trying to give you a sense of it all and how it's all very interconnected and very relevant we're really looking at exciting times ahead now when we have just the recent launch of the james Webb space telescope and the upcoming launch in a few years of the aerial space telescope and also the recent um, ground-based facility, ALMA, which gives extremely high resolution as well. And between all these facilities, um, it's just going to be amazing what we find out um, in the coming years. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Deirdre. That was excellent. Um, well done. I, I learned a lot there. And it's um, uh, we live in very interesting times, don't we, for, for space exploration and so on. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions in the chat. Um, are you happy to go through? Sure, yeah. Of course. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, Terry, do you want to ask your first question? Yeah, uh, I have a whole lot, as always, Deirdre, you know me. Uh, I was just thinking of the knots in the 